welcome to this Gresham Lecture, which I've called Becoming Expert. I'm Roger Kneebone, Professor of Surgical Education and Engagement Science at Imperial College London and Gresham Visiting Professor of Medical Education. And my book, Expert, um, explores a number of ideas which I'm going to expand on over the course of the next 50 minutes or, or so. I've called the book Expert Understanding the Path to Mastery. And in my talk, I'm going to explore the, the idea of, of a path towards mastery, what that might look like, what it might mean, and how we might recognise its various different stages. I'm going to start off with some acknowledgements. I need to acknowledge a number of people who have been pivotal in creating this book. Joshua Byrne, uh, a bespoke tailor, uh, many, many other uh, members of the cast, so to speak, of, of the book, um, experts in their various ways, many of whom I'll be uh, showing you over the course of the next hour or so. Um, Paul Craddock, filmmaker and cultural historian, and, of course, Penguin Books and my editors there, Jack Ram and Connor Brown, and the many other people who are part of Penguin. Uh, and it was, of course, Penguin that published my book only last month. I'd like to draw your attention also to my podcast called Countercurrent, where for a number of years now I've been having conversations with, uh, with people whose interests cross boundaries. Many of those, too, uh, appear in, in, in my book, Expert. So if you, would like to, um, if you would like to sample those, here is the link. And if you just put in Countercurrent and my surname, Kneebone, into any search engine, uh, the site will come up. So, a little bit of background about myself to begin with. I, I lead two centres. One is the Centre for Engagement and Simulation Science at Imperial College London. And the other is the joint Imperial Royal College of Music Centre for Performance Science. And I'm going to be drawing on perspectives from both of those over the course of my talk. For those of you who don't know the Royal College of Music, it's in South Kensington, in central London. Um, this is the college from the front, and if we look uh, over from Imperial College, we see the Royal College of Music and then the Royal Albert Hall, and beyond that, Hyde Park towards the north. So you can see that we are very close neighbours geographically, but also, I think, conceptually. Now, over the last couple of years, I've, I've delivered... Um, eight lectures so far, Gresham lectures, around the theme of performing medicine, performing surgery, the theme of performance. And in those lectures, I've explored the idea that, that we can think of medicine not, not only as a science, not only of a set of, of, of component skills, but also as performance. And clinical practice, I think, takes place at an intersection of those three. Uh, Although, as a patient, I think we very often are most aware of the performance. And in, in my book, Expert, I'm going to explore this idea of the intersection of kinds of knowing. I'm going to start by outlining the idea of a path to mastery, drawing on the, I think, to many people, well-known model from the medieval guilds of a trajectory that goes from being an apprentice when you know nothing to begin with to becoming a journeyman when you go out into the world after a number of years as an apprentice you 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 have the skills that are necessary to go across your country to journey uh, and to ply your trade or your craft and then eventually you in your turn become a master you have apprentices of your own and the wheel comes full circle and I use these terms because I think that this is a, a model that many people are familiar with although nowadays of course these are not gendered terms we talk about journeymen and, and masters equally for men and women of course and I think this model is a is a useful one but it's as far as it goes but it's incomplete it's a mass, it's, it's a model that describes the process but doesn't really explain it. Uh, and in my book, I go further than this, and I, I draw on that, um, on that approach, that general structure, and you can see along the top of this image, which appears in different forms throughout the book, the apprentice, journeyman, master divisions. But I've divided each of these into categories that, that, that explore the processes that we, all of us, go through on a journey to becoming, towards becoming a master. 
And I say we all go through, because to me, becoming an expert is something that applies to all of us. Not everyone is a, a, a leading international expert uh, along the lines of many of the ones I'm going to be um, describing to you in a moment. But we are all of us somewhere in uh, a, a path of getting better at whatever it is we are passionate about. It might be our work, it might be a sport, it might be learning a language or playing a musical instrument, all kinds of things. But to me, becoming expert is a basic human characteristic. So I'm going to start off by exploring what, what it means to be an expert and, and how we can use that word. And I'm going to start, as I do in the book, by introducing you to Derek Frampton, who is a taxidermist. He's been a taxidermist for decades. He's a, a, a leading exponent of his, of his art. And when I first met him in his workshop, he was posing this clouded leopard and her cub. I hadn't seen a clouded leopard before. I didn't know what one looked like. But I was immediately struck by, by the beauty and the artistry of this, of this creature. And I asked Derek to explain what tax, taxidermy is all about. Uh, I asked him, was it a, a science or a craft or an art? What was it? And he said, well, it wasn't one of those things. It was an amalgam of all of them. It, it was partly a science, partly a craft, partly an art. And, and rather in the way of that diagram I showed you just now about, about the world of medicine, taxidermy takes place at an intersection between these different ways of knowing. So, of course, there is science. So when Derek... Uh, sets up, as he calls it, a, an animal. It might be a big cat like this one. It has to be absolutely precise. His, his creatures will be used as reference points by zoologists. Many of them are animals perhaps on the verge of extinction or particular specimens that have to be uh, absolutely precise. And so he takes measurements. Um, but there, there is also craft. And when I saw him in his workshop, it became abundantly clear how complex that craft is. So here he is, um, in this case, working with a, with a small creature. And when I asked him how this works in practice, he showed me a piece of apparatus that he's been using for decades with tools that he inherited from his own master. And he showed me how he um, manipulates these tiny creatures to sculpt them exactly precisely. He works with animals. He works with birds, with reptiles, with fish, with mammals, with all kinds of creatures. And when I, when I asked him again how he was able to create this beautiful clouded leopard, he said, well, it's not that difficult, really. All you do is you take off the skin, and then you cure the skin and you prepare it, and then you just sculpt a clouded leopard that size and shape, and you put the skin back on. And to me, it was that just that summarises what it is to be expert. Because to me, this is completely incomprehensible. I have no idea how you could sculpt any clouded leopard, let alone one that was exactly that size and shape and put the skin back on. But to Derek, with his decades of experience, this had become second nature. So I'm going to give you two other examples of experts. The next one is Andrew Garlick, who's a harpsichord maker. He makes instruments like this. For those of you who may not be familiar with the harpsichord, it looks at first glance like a piano. It actually works completely differently. Instead of striking strings with a hammer, it plucks them with a plectrum. And Andrew, for decades, has been creating these extraordinarily beautiful instruments, creating every single part of them himself, including the decoration. So we see him here in his workshop in the background. There's a, an unpainted um, framework of a harpsichord and in the foreground a soundboard that he's beginning to decorate. You can see that he, he, he too can, um, can create images of, of birds and flowers and, and all kinds of decorative approaches that, um, that are inspired by harpsichords in museums around the world, 18th, 16th, 17th century instruments, uh, but on which he, to which he brings his own individuality, his own, his own style, his own personality as a harpsichord maker. But of course, what harpsichords look like is only part of the story. Um, crucially, they depend on what they feel like to play and, of course, what they sound like. So here is just a brief glimpse of Andrew with one of his own instruments.
So we get a sense of the, of the richness and the variety of tone, uh, as well as the visual impact of this instrument. But although, of course, what we can't, what we can't experience on a video clip is what, what an instrument like that feels like to play, what it feels like under your fingers. And my third example is Andrew Davidson, who's a, a wood engraver. He creates uh, engravings of extraordinary precision and beauty. And he kindly invited me to see him at work uh, in his house in Gloucestershire. And when I joined him, he explained the process that he goes through. They gave you that. They and gave you an idea. Or did an they idea. Or just these that's photos? right. And then they gave me the reference that they'd like me to, to concentrate on. Yes. So you get these beautiful old spades. And then for that, I can get the grain of the wood and things. Then I make a drawing. And that's the drawing. And then I send that to the client and they go, yes, that's fine. And then I can transpose that onto a block. So I've just reduced it down a little bit and put it onto this prepared block. It's, it's, it's painted in quink ink, so I can see any marks I make. This just holds it into position, it stops it wobbling around a bit. It's just getting it nice and smooth. And as I always say with inking up, it should sound like a lilo slowly deflating and it shouldn't sound like you're frying chips. Now I'm just going to test, I haven't printed this for years so I don't know what this is going to look like. Yes, yeah, or, or it had to be in a particular position on the page, then it's, it needs to be registered. So I can feel that, that might be a little bit light. And you can actually look on the back of the page or the paper and you can see where the block's gone into the into the paper and from that I'm going to say that the top is a lot heavier than the bottom. Still, it's not too bad. It's a little bit over inked so I don't need as much ink on that now actually. Of the ink off That's much better. So you can see the difference between these two. Less ink and a little bit dabbing on the wings has just given it a little softer approach, which I think works better. Let, let, let me get this clear. Mm. This, this picture here mm. is, what you, is what you put onto the block. Yes. And this, this extraordinary level of detail over mm. there mm. is what you're doing as you're... As you're, you're drawing... You're drawing with these tools, you're putting light into the darkness. Of course, the other thing is, it's an abstraction anyway, isn't it? Um, the whole process is abstract. Each mark is just a mark, but combined together, produce a recognisable form. But you must already have got to the end in your mind before you can start the beginning with yes, your Yes, sort of, yes. Uh -huh. You have a rough idea which way you're going. And certainly, the, there's no room for error. So, so here is an expert who I think shows many aspects of what it means to be expert. The kind of work that we saw Andrew Davidson there doing involved a deep physical understanding of his materials and himself and the tools that he's working with. And when he talks about, about painting with light, 
by engraving marks in a block of wood. He's, I think, using a kind of shorthand for something that has taken him decades to develop, like the other experts I've just shown you. So I'm going to take a sideways step now, and I'm going to talk a bit about my own career, because throughout this book, I draw on examples from my own experience uh, in the different phases of my career so far. The first one was as a, uh, a general and trauma surgeon. Um, after becoming a consultant, I then changed direction and for the next 17 or 18 years was a, a GP, a family doctor in the southwest of England. And then after that, I changed again and became an academic and joined the university where I, where I now work. And in, in my book, Expert, I, I, I counterpose the experiences I've had within medicine and some of them beyond it, as I'll show, with, um, with the stories of experts outside medicine altogether. But to give you a sense of the kind of work I was uh, doing in the first stage of my career, I'm going to take you to South Africa, to Soweto in Johannesburg in the 1980s, where I spent a number of years at a huge hospital called Baragwanath. This was Soweto at the time, uh, a township on the outskirts of Johannesburg with a population of well over a million people. Nobody knew exactly how many. Uh, and Baragwanath Hospital, where I was, was, the, was the, the main hospital for that whole population. It was an extraordinary experience being there. It was quite unlike anything I'd encountered in the UK. This is a, a view of one of the wards. Um, you can see that there are patients closely packed down both sides of the ward. What you don't see is that there are patients on tiny stretchers underneath each of those beds. Um, and the, um, the approach to surgical care was quite different from anything I'd encountered as well. So here we have a, um, a glimpse of two young men who were stabbed in the chest the previous night. They both had collapsed lungs. They had blood in the cavity around their lungs, which had to be drained out. And you can see that the man in the centre of the picture is holding a glass bottle, which is an intercostal drain. Blood and air are draining out through a tube into that bottle. Uh, and he's walking around, which is very helpful in terms of reinflating his lungs. Uh, but he still needs to have intravenous fluids. And you can just about make out that he has a bag of intravenous fluids on his head. You can see some nurses there from the ward that he's, uh, that he's come from. Uh, and in every respect, this was a completely uh, uh, extraordinary experience for me. At that time, I was learning to become a surgeon. I'm over here on the right in this picture, uh, leading a team in the middle of the night, a team of people not much older than I am. Uh, on the left in white is the anaesthetist opposite me, um, a medical student as my first assistant, and in the background, just visible, uh, that crucial member of the surgical team, the scrub nurse, from whom I learned an enormous amount. Um, and at that time, I was, I was moving along a path towards becoming better at carrying out surgery. But of course, there were bumps along the way. There were things that, that didn't go well. There were all kinds of things which I'll refer to uh, later on in the talk and which I explore in the book. Um, but at that stage, I was beginning to move out of my apprenticeship, I would say. And so I'm going to take you back away from my experiences in Africa to consider what it means to be at the early stages of one's path towards mastery. And I've divided this stage into sections in order to explain the internal processes that I think everybody needs to go through as they move forward on that journey. The first one I've called doing time. After that, I'm going to be talking about how, how that process of spending a lot of time doing things leads to a familiarity with materials and tools and also explore how it helps learning to navigate space and work with other people. But let's start with doing time. And here I'm going to take you to introduce you to Joshua Byrne, uh, a bespoke tailor. Joshua um, pra works near Savile Row in London. And when I asked him to describe his work, rather like Derek Frampton, the taxidermist, he too described his work as a, as a mixture of science and art and craft. There has to be precision, great precision. This is a diagrammatic representation of a garment. Uh, and you can see that rather like that 
picture of the, of the big cat with its measurements. Um, this is a two-dimensional representation of a complex three-dimensional reality which Joshua has to be able to work with. But he also has to do stuff. And so here's a glimpse of Joshua just showing some of the skills he uses when he puts a collar onto a jacket because Joshua spent many years as an apprentice jacket maker. I'm not going to say too much about him now because my next Gresham lecture in a, in a week's time on Wednesday the 7th of October will be with Joshua. He's going to be joining me here uh, in, in the hall to describe more about the parallels between tailoring and medicine. Um, but for the purposes of this lecture, I want, to, I want to draw on one particular thing he told me about his early days as an apprentice. Now, Joshua hadn't always wanted to be a tailor. To begin with, he went to university, he was studying economics and agriculture, and, and unexpectedly, he, he suddenly realised when he, when he watched a film, actually, where there was a, a, a brief glimpse of a tailor, that that's what he wanted to do. So he left university and he um, became apprenticed to a jacket maker. And at first he found this a, a jolt because he had to spend days, weeks and months just learning how to do stuff that he could understand in principle but couldn't yet do in practice. And for him, what represents that now, more than anything else, is pocket flaps. Now, pocket flaps on jackets aren't as easy as they look. They have to be um, carefully shaped. They have to sit absolutely correctly to conform to the curve of the jacket, and they're extremely difficult to make. And for months, Joshua struggled with making them. Every so often, his master would come and look over his shoulder and just shake his head and say, no, not good enough, but wouldn't tell him why. So Joshua had to keep on doing it again and again and again. And at first he thought he was going to go out of his mind with boredom. It seemed repetitive work with no particular value at the time. But looking back on it afterwards, he, he came to realise that that experience of doing repetitive work of little value at the time was actually of incalculable value because that's how he... He, he internalised those skills and those abilities that he's drawn on ever since. And of course, there were many other kinds of repetitive tasks that he had to do later on. But one of the things he pointed out to me was that at university, he was accustomed to grasping a concept, applying it, and then moving quickly on to the next concept, to a fairly rapid process. Whereas as an apprentice jacket maker, he had to come to terms with the fact that he was struggling to do things that he could understand in theory but couldn't do in practice. And he had to get used to this longer time frame that it took years before he could truly internalise and embody those skills that he later came to depend on. Many other experts I've spoken to tell a similar story. Paul Jakeman uh, is now one of the country's leading stone carvers. He leads the um, historic stone carving course at the City and Guilds of London Art School, where people go to learn to restore um, medieval cathedrals, ancient buildings, gargoyles. Um, and, and he and his colleagues uh, in, their, in their workshop tell a similar story that they haven't always been creating sculptures of this kind. To begin with, Paul said, he spent his first six months as an apprentice in the stonemason's yard trying and trying and trying to make a perfectly smooth horizontal surface out of a block of granite. And when his master finally said, Paul, that's OK, you can do that, he expected that he would be going up ladders and working on gargoyles on cathedrals. But no, his master made him spend the next six months producing a perfectly smooth vertical surface on another block of granite. And he too almost went out of his mind with boredom, boring, repetitive work of no apparent value at the time. But of course for him too, um, and for everybody who starts off on this path to, to mastery, doing repetitive work is absolutely essential. For me, it was different. It was, uh, it was carrying out clinical procedures, learning to take blood, learning to put up drips, learning to do all kinds of things that at the time didn't seem particularly interesting to me, although, of course, they were crucially important to every patient. But to me, it seemed like a bit of a waste of time. But looking back on it, I realised that it was nothing but. It was quite the reverse. And so I'm going to... 
I'm going to move on from doing time and the, the knowledge and experience that that gives you in materials and tools and techniques. To think about something else that, that, that also isn't, isn't always spoken of, I think, which is how you learn to manage the space that you're in and the people you're with. And I'm going to introduce you to another expert, this time a hairstylist, Fabrice Renguet. Now, Fabrice, for many years, was the uh, director of the training academy at Tony and Guy, hairstylist. And, of course, he is himself very expert at the physicality of cutting hair, and he's a, an expert teacher, too. Um, and I asked Fabrice to come to talk to the surgical, the surgeons on a master's programme in surgical education, which I lead at Imperial College, and, and, and show some of the techniques that he teaches his young stylists to do. And partly this is, this is the skill of dealing with, with hair. He's showing in this short video, which I'm going to show in a second or two, he's showing how he manages long hair using a, an inanimate mannequin. Um, and the first thing I was struck by was the facility with which he can manage um, these, these different kinds of hair and how he brings together his skills with scissors and a comb and is able to, to manipulate the hair itself. But even more interesting, I think, is how he learnt to do this on, on his clients. Because to begin with, he too went through that stage of doing time. He spent months sweeping up hair clippings from the floor of his salon, making tea, taking it to clients. And then eventually he was allowed to start shampooing people's hair. And he learnt the skills of approaching somebody whom he might not have met before, approaching them from behind or from the side when they could see him, usually in the mirror but not directly, and, and gaining the skills of of, of developing a rapport with somebody and putting them at their ease. The skills which now, of course, he uses every day when he's styling his own customer's hair, but also the skills that he passes on to his own trainees when they're learning to do the same. So that's the first stage, being an apprentice. The next stage, the journeyman stage, um, I think is particularly interesting and there are two aspects of this stage that I, I haven't read about very much, I haven't heard people talk about, but I think they're crucially important. The first one I've called, It's Not About You, and the second one I've called Developing Voice. And both of these are about the need for a shift in where you place your attention. So the phrase, It's Not About You, I've borrowed from some expert magicians I've been working with. Now, magicians say, um, and, and I think most of us will, will resonate with this, that, that they spend an awful lot of time to begin with learning how to do tricks, uh, practicing in front of the mirror, making coins and cards disappear and appear. Um, and, and after a few years of doing that, they, they tend to be proud of what they can do and they want to show it off. And, and that resonated with me too, being at medical school and passing lots of exams and things. There came a time when I, I felt that I knew quite a lot and I, I, wanted to, I wanted to show people what I knew. But when I had a... a um, I, I arranged a, a one-day event at the Art Workers Guild in London, here it is, with a group of magicians and a group of surgeons. And here are four of the magicians. You can see that we're around a table with some surgical instruments and we're exploring what there might possibly be in common between these two apparently unconnected areas of expert practice. The magician said to me, they, all of them said that there came a point, after, usually after they'd been using most of their teenage years to practice magic tricks, when they realised that just being able to do clever, dexterous things with their hands wasn't enough. It was only magic if they could make somebody else believe, even just for an instant, that something that was impossible had actually happened. And they said, you have to realise that it's not about you, it's about them. It's not about you, the performer, showing what you can do. It's about the experience that you create for whoever's watching. And I think this is crucially important because... 
we are all of us performing to somebody as we become more and more expert. It may be somebody there at the time. It may be somebody in a live audience. It may be a patient. It may be a customer. It may be a client. Or it might be somebody who experiences our work later on. It might be that we're a ceramicist, perhaps, and we make pots which are only seen later. But nonetheless, there is always an audience. And so although that ability to do stuff with our hands, which I've already been talking about, uh, which in the case of, of, of magicians is very impressive in itself, that, that dexterity, that facility, um, that in itself isn't enough. And so I'm going to give you a brief glimpse now of one of those magicians at that event at the Artworks Guild, Will Houston, well known to his peers as being a, 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 a an expert in many ways. But here we're going to see a brief glimpse of him doing a trick which is, which is very difficult to do, but where the effect is created not just by what he does with his hands, but about how he engages with his audience. In this case, an audience of fellow magicians. Now, I'm not going to touch them. Instead, I'll keep my hands just slightly over the top all the way through. Now, hopefully, if I give a little wave, one of the coins will jump, followed by the second, and then the third. Another wave, one goes back, second goes back, and the third goes back, and then covering them all for just a second, they all make their way together. <laughs> so here I think is a, is a composite of extraordinary skill, but extraordinary ability to manage an audience and to create a sense that something that couldn't have happened has happened. It's not about you. But the second theme, the second strand in the journeyman stage, which, which often seems to go in the opposite direction, is that in, a, in another sense it is about you. And, and here I'm drawing on what the jazz musicians talk about as voice. So the jazz musicians talk, of course, in the early stages, they, like everybody else, doing time learning to work with other people, they're practicing scales and arpeggios, they're learning repertoire, they're learning to do all kinds of things. But after a while, they stop just being a cipher, uh, a, a, an anonymous saxophonist or trumpeter, and they develop their own individuality, their style, their uniqueness, to the point where, if you like that kind of music, you can instantly tell whether it's Miles Davis or Freddie Hubbard or some, somebody else playing a particular instrument. You can recognise that at once. And so there is a tension between, between taking your attentional focus away from yourself to whoever your work is for, but at the same time developing and, uh, and, and allowing to mature your own unique personality and style. But it isn't all plain sailing. Always there are things that go wrong. And so I'm going to spend a little time now um, drawing on one of my own experiences, which has never left me. It, it was when I was a trainee surgeon at Baragwanath Hospital in Soweto in the 1980s. Opposite the hospital was a tiny flying club. It's gone now. Um, it was very, very small. Um, and I learned to fly a light aircraft. This is the flying club from above. It didn't have a control tower only had run one runway, just a couple of tiny planes. And the part of South Africa where it was, uh, was surrounded by many small airports, but they were tiny airports. Many of them didn't even have a tarmac runway. You had to land on a grass field. Um, and when I passed my pilot, private pilot's license, I wanted to go on a flight to an airfield, to an airport, with a control tower to practice my skills in that way. And I decided to go to a nearby airport called Rand Airport. The people at the flying school said, um, it's very easy, Roger, as soon as you've taken off, uh, you'll see, t t turn left and then you'll see a big water tower and then uh, turn left again and after a little while you'll see the runway of Rand Airport. So that's what I did. I took off, I turned left, I saw the water tower, I turned left again. It took a little while before I saw the runway. It wasn't exactly what I was expecting, but, um, but it was clearly there. So I radioed into Rand Airport. <clears throat> I explained that I'd, I'd like to land. They gave me permission to land, and I did. But as I was taxiing along the runway after I'd come down, I, I started to get a, an uncomfortable feeling um, because I saw a row of jumbo jets 
lined up by the side of the runway. And then I saw a big sign that said, Welcome to Johannesburg International Airport. At which point my radio crackled into life and there was a furious, furious message from the control tower asking what the hell I thought I was doing, landing unannounced at one of the continent of Africa's largest and busiest airports. By the grace of God, there wasn't an airliner coming down to land at the same time. And actually, the people at the control tower, because it was rather a quiet afternoon, had, had allowed their attention to lapse. And they hadn't noticed me arriving either. So after a very uncomfortable interview with the control tower staff, I was allowed to get back into my small aeroplane and fly back to Baraguanath Flying Club. Immediately, I went and sought out my flying instructor, Bill, to confess to him what had happened because I wanted him to hear it from me first. And I was expecting a really severe dressing down because what I'd done could have been catastrophic. It could have killed me and loads of other people. But actually, what happened, to my astonishment, was uh, Bill took me into a little room. He closed the door. He got out a couple of glasses and a bottle, poured us each a drink, uh, and then burst into laughter. And he started to tell me about some of the things that he'd done that he'd never mentioned before. He told me, for instance, about the time when he was landing a twin-engined aeroplane and he forgot to put down the undercarriage, forgot to pull the lever that put the undercarriage down, and he wrote the aeroplane off. And I realised then that having made this mistake of my own, which could have been catastrophic, actually opened up a channel of communication with other experts who had also made mistakes, but never told me about theirs until they realised I'd made one of my own. Now, this wasn't to minimise the, the importance of the mistake that I'd made, but I think my instructor realised that I was a hair's breadth away from losing my confidence completely and never flying again. And he helped me make sense of that experience and, and allow me to feel that I was part of a wider group of people who had also made mistakes, because making mistakes is an inevitable part of progressing along that path to mastery. It's not something you can avoid. It's something you just have to cope with and learn to deal with. And of course, everyone I've spoken to has that experience of making mistakes. I've uh, experienced it, of course, in my clinical career, as, as everybody has. Uh, but all, all the other experts I've introduced to you so far, and many others in the book, tell similar stories of, of things that, that they had to deal with even though they didn't feel they knew how at the time. And that brings me on to another aspect of being expert. As people get more and more towards the stage of becoming masters, um, I think the ability to improvise becomes more and more important. And I'm going to pick this up later on in the talk when we talk about some of the things that are going on at the moment uh, in, in the world that we're in. Because I think... The ability to improvise is a characteristic of being really expert. Now, I'm not talking about improvising in the sense of just knocking something up on the spur of the moment and not being able to be bothered to do it properly. Not at all. Quite the reverse. To me, improvisation is a very high form of art and skill, which involves being able to respond very quickly in the moment to a new situation and bring into play all kinds of things that you've spent years, often decades, learning to master. And I'm going to give you an example from the world of music again. This is, um, this is a, a, brief, a, a brief example by David Dolan, professor of classical improvisation at the Guildhall, and one of his distinguished colleagues, Thomas Carroll, a cellist, professor of cello at the Royal College of Music and elsewhere. Um, and they, they're just about to start to play... Uh, the first of Schumann's three fantasy pieces, Opus 73. And what we're going to see here is a brief glimpse of an introduction that they play that is improvised. Um, David at the piano there, you can see that he's not looking at the music. Um, and, and he and Thomas are going to provide a very brief introduction, which they have not rehearsed or prepared, but which they are jointly creating in the moment, in the spirit of the music by Schumann, which they will then be going to play. We won't have time to listen to the music by Schumann, but we will join them um, 
for the beginning, for their, their introduction. And you'll, you'll see the moment when the improvisation stops because David Dolan at the piano then lifts his gaze from the keyboard to the written music on the music stand. their performance. But to me this exemplifies many of the things that I've been talking about so far. We see two people who have clearly made that transition. It, it isn't about them. It's about one another and the audience who's listening. And yet it is about them in the sense that they have their individuality uh, and their own skills and they're bringing these together um, acutely conscious and aware of one another to, to, to create something, to improvise something that has never been played before but is not random it's, it's highly, highly expert in the way that they've created it and to me this is improvisation of a very high order but of course improvisation isn't confined to the world of music you find it in surgery, you find it in tailoring you find it in hairstyling, you find it in all of the examples I've given so far, so far and many others besides. The final stage is of becoming a master. And here, to go back to my diagram in the book, I've called this stage passing it on. Because this, I think, is not just a question of being able to do stuff outstandingly well yourself, but it's the stage where, where you make another transition from... It's not about you, it's about, it's about them. Only this time, them is, is the people you are helping to develop and tread the path that you have already been going along. So I'm going to introduce you now to Sophie Yates, who's a very distinguished harpsichordist. She's a recitalist, recording artist. She broadcasts, she travels all over the world giving harpsichord recitals. And here she is with uh, her instrument, which was made by Andrew Garlick, whom we met earlier. Um, and I've been very fortunate in that I've been having harpsichord lessons with Sophie for over 20 years now. Um, and I can tell you from experience that her approach to teaching, I think, embodies the idea of being a master. Because Sophie, first of all, is able to teach all kinds of people, whether it's a 10-year-old beginning their their, their work on a keyboard or whether, whether she's working with an international concert pianist to help them understand more about the particular repertoire she works with or if it's somebody like myself who's an enthusiastic but not particularly gifted amateur, whoever it is, she's able to identify what each person is struggling with and to help them put it right. And in the book I, I give an example of, of when I was struggling with a, a particular piece of music and she said... Not, not something vague like, Roger, you must make this more expressive or, or, or make it sound better. No, she, she, she saw that there was a particular problem I had with the angle of my hand on the keyboard and she just put her hand on mine and just moved it fractionally and it made all the difference. And so the ability here of a master not only to, to embody knowledge and skill but also wisdom, the wisdom of knowing what is needed, when, by whom, and being able to help that person, and being able to help that person improve or change. And I think this stage of being a master is a crucially important one because we see it 
with people who are, who are um, teaching individual students, like Sophie here, but we also see it when people feed back that wisdom and knowledge of decades into the whole wider landscape of the world that they're in. It might be that they teach in a, a university or a college or, uh, or that they have apprentices of their own. Whatever it is, they are taking responsibility not only for individual component skills, but for the development of people as they themselves go through this path from apprentice to journeyman to master. So in the last few minutes, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to think more widely about why we need experts and what experts can do for us and what we can do for them. And in the book, in the last chapter of the book, I try to bring together some of these ideas because it seems to me that there are, we need experts for several reasons, two main reasons. One is we need experts for the things that they can do that we can't. We need people to fly us in aeroplanes, to operate on us when we're sick, to fix our boilers when they go wrong or our cars when they need to be fixed in a, in a garage. We need experts who are able to do the things that we can't do. Um, I think often there's a, a problem when we, we, we think of experts in terms of the area that they're expert in and we, we tend, to, we tend to, to think of people like brain surgeons perhaps or concert pianists or fighter pilots as being in a different part of a hierarchy from plasterers or uh, plumbers or garage mechanics. But I think that this is a great mistake because I think that the, the characteristics of experts that I've described in my talk are not defined by a particular field. They are a characteristic of that person who has been through that path to become expert. And of course, these days more than ever, we need experts um, in, these, in these uncertain and tumultuous times. Uh, we're constantly hearing about experts and the relationship with experts, the trust we do or do not put into experts, whether they be clinicians or epidemiologists or educationalists. Um, and so there is an important characteristic, I think, of experts, which is often overlooked, which is not just their skills and their knowledge, but their wisdom. And it takes me back to, to one of my early experiences at Baragwanath Hospital when my consultant said to me, Roger, Think of it like this. A surgeon knows how to operate. A good surgeon knows when to operate. But a really good surgeon knows when not to operate. And I think this is a characteristic of the wisdom of experts. We often underestimate um, what they can do and, and what they've gone through to get there because we only see isolated aspects of their expert practice. And we think, well, that doesn't look so difficult. I could do that too. And there are probably YouTube videos that allow us to practice some of those things we see. And we probably could do those things too. But what we cannot do, if we have not been along that path, is to, is to know when not to operate, when not to fix a boiler, when not to do things. We cannot know how to exercise judgment. That's one reason we need experts. The other reason we need experts is that experts are not some... some, some exotic, rare creatures outside our experience. We are all of us on the path towards becoming expert. We may not all of us get as far as some of these other people. Most of us don't. But that doesn't mean we're not on that path. And we are all of us, because we are humans, we are on a path to making the, the most we can of the opportunities we have, the skills, the aptitudes we have, and the things that we passionately want to do, whether it's a work or an occupation outside work, whatever it is, this is a basic human characteristic. And I think there are real problems at the moment because the process of becoming expert is often misunderstood. The fact is that anybody becoming expert in anything at all is going to have to take a very long time to get there. The stages that I've described of doing time, learning to work with other people, going out into the world, making mistakes, recovering from the learning to improvise, passing your knowledge on, all those things 
don't happen in five minutes. They don't happen in a year. They take years or decades. And there is a very dangerous tendency, I think, now for people to want to, to do everything faster, quickly, and more cheaply. And I think this is very dangerous because, as I point out in the book, you simply cannot cook a cake in half the time by cooking it at twice the temperature. It doesn't work. Some things have to take as long as they take, and becoming expert is one of those things. And I think one of the problems we're facing at the moment in society is that we are systematically eradicating or, or destroying very often the conditions which becoming expert requires. From birth through kindergarten, primary school, secondary school, and then beyond, we need to make sure that people have the opportunity to experience the material world, to experience working with one another, and to start going through those stages that I've outlined in, uh, in my talk. But we are, we are seeing school curriculums being eviscerated. We are seeing opportunities for people to use their hands in DT, in cooking, in art, uh, to perform in front of other people, to learn musical instruments, to, uh, to take part in plays, to, to, to have those experiences at an early stage, which later expert uh, development depends on, those are at risk of being, um, of, 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 of being removed from everybody's experience. And I think this is both a tragedy and a disgrace, because it's only by creating the conditions which allow experts to grow, that we will end up with the experts we need to help us navigate these uncertain times. And of course, at the moment, these are more uncertain than we've any of us experienced in our lives so far in many ways. And the relationship that we have with experts as members of society, I think, is crucially important because, of course, we should not accept uncritically what people say to us just because they call themselves experts. But equally, we should not dismiss what people have to share with us because they are experts. And I think the crux here is not the knowledge or the skill so much of experts, although that is, that is vitally important, but the wisdom and the help that they can give us in navigating difficult times, difficult decisions, and making the right choices about where to go next. So in this book, I've... I've I've, I've sketched out this pathway from knowing nothing as an apprentice to knowing quite a lot, but still more to go as a journeyman, and then passing that knowledge on as a, as a master. And the process has a clear beginning. But I want to finish by saying that I, I think it does not have a clear end. There is no point at which any of the people I've talked to have said, well, that's fine. I've become an expert now. I can stop. Becoming expert is a journey without a definite conclusion. It's a process that continues for as long as we live. And it's a process, as I said, not only for us to, to witness in some of the experts that I've mentioned and many others you'll be aware of in your own areas of interest, not only experts like those, but to recognise that the path to becoming expert is a path that we are all treading on. And I'm going to leave the last word with Joshua Byrne. Um, the tailor, when I asked him his thoughts about this, he said something that I thought was very illuminating. He said, he said, all this time I've been learning how to make jackets and suits. And I know that there's no such thing as the perfect suit. But I'm never going to stop trying to make one. Thank you. lecture and um, introducing us to so many extraordinary people with extraordinary talents and telling us their stories. You won't be surprised to hear that there's been a great deal of interest and I've got quite a few questions Good. here, so brace yourself. The first one is the most popular question, um, is a fascinating one. Uh, in 2016, in the lead up to the Brexit vote, Michael Gove said that, um, and this is in quotation marks here, Britain has had enough of experts. Putting aside the politics, please, if possible, and this is what the questioner have asked you to do, what is the significance of such a statement for the culture of this country? Thank you. So 
I think this is I think this is a crucially important question because it goes to the heart of the relationship I mentioned between us as, as society and experts. And I think it um, I think it points out a lack of trust and a lack of understanding really of what it means to become expert. I think somebody could only say that this country has had enough of experts if they didn't really understand what it meant to be expert. And I hope I've explained over the last hour or so what I think that, that, what I think that process involves. But there has to be, I think, a, um, a relationship of, of, of faith and trust, in a sense, that allows us to, to reap the benefits of this cumulated wisdom um, that experts have gathered. And when we're, when we're faced with, particularly with new challenges, what we need, I think, is expert improvisers. What we've seen uh, over the last few months is the need for expert improvisation, improvisation in the sense of that clip with David Dolan, the pianist, and Thomas Carroll, the cellist. Because I think there we need to be able to take uh, on trust that people have uh, the wisdom that they can share with us that we will not ourselves be able to understand because we haven't been along that same path for 40 years that they have. Now, that's not to say that we could at all, that we should accept unquestioningly um, the, the things that other people say if we do not have the confidence in them as experts. But I think if we try and chisel away at what it means to be expert, there is a, a corrosive and destructive effect that, um, that gets in the way of us having the benefit of people who can tell us not only, not only who are able to operate, but who can advise us about when to operate and, crucially, when not to operate. Very good. So here's someone else who's bringing this um, into the sort of contemporary sphere. It's a very interesting question. It says... Um, mach machines are increasingly taking on many of the repetitive tasks that used to be part of apprenticeship. How is this likely to undermine the path to mastery that you describe? That's a very interesting question too. Um, I think probably this is a question that might have been asked at any time over many hundreds of years because there have always been machines and technologies um, that have been raising questions, although now perhaps more than ever. Um, I, I should say at, 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 from the outset that, that I'm not making an argument against machines or technology, quite the contrary. I think that there will be new kinds of becoming expert uh, which will incorporate the use of machines. I think machines, of course, can do many things uh, that would be boring and repetitive for people to do, but they cannot exercise judgment and wisdom. I think that, uh, that the, the balance will shift as it continues to shift in what it is that people need to do themselves by hand and what it is that machines can do for them or perhaps better with them. Um, and I think that the, uh, my response really would be to say that the, that the path to becoming expert is, is, is peopled by human beings, of course, but it is also peopled by uh, by machines and instruments and tools, and that as technology changes, the balance may shift about which bits are needed to be done in which way, but there will always need to be that uh, symbiotic relationship. Very good. Now, I've got three people here who um, want some advice from you. Um, one person said this, and three others want to, want to know the answer too. It says, hello, Professor. I am a student hoping to go to university in a year or two to read medicine. Uh, thus, perhaps, maybe not yet in the apprentice stage on the path to mastery. But I'd really like to please ask, what sort of mindset would you most like to encourage for someone like me who has not yet immersed himself into their profession of choice? Thank you. Another very interesting question. I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure that you're not in the apprentice stage. I, I think that, actually, we are all of us in the early stages of what will crystallise as a particular kind of apprenticeship from very early on. And, and, and that's what I meant by saying that I think these opportunities at school uh, 
uh, of, of doing things and getting varied experiences are crucially important. So I would say that the, the, the principal characteristic, I think, um, the most valuable one is curiosity and a willingness to engage with the world in various ways. And it might be by doing stuff or by talking to people or by finding things out or looking things up online, whatever it might happen to be. I think that that way of thinking that, uh, that, that propels you to find out more and to try things out and particularly to try things out and do stuff with your hands to, to actually uh, not not only with your hands but with your body to to recognize that medicine in particular alongside many other things is not is not purely a question of absorbing and then applying scientific knowledge it's very much as I said at the beginning an amalgam of science and craft and art and performance and I think anything that you can do that gives you a richer understanding and, and starts to pique your interest in the performance, the craft and the skill, as well as the science, will stand you in very good stead. Wonderful advice. Uh, priceless, I'm sure. I, there are lots of questions here. I'm just going to ask you two more, um, which we've got time for, I think. Um, here's, here's quite a challenging one for you. Um, you've discussed um, ten experts who are men, including yourself, and one expert who is a woman. Um, and then she was discussed within the context of passing on expertise to others in a teaching capacity. Does this say anything about expertise? Um, no. <laughs> not, not, if, if, if the question is about is expertise, um, do, do you find it more in men than women? Then I think, of course, absolutely not. Um, I chose these particular examples because I thought they would illustrate aspects of the uh, of the journey I describe in my book. I have a number of other examples, and, and, and they include women, of course, they do. Um, if the question is about whether people are drawn towards different areas of expert practice, um, I don't know. I mean, in, in, in my experience, um, in my experience, expertise or becoming expert isn't the province of, 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 of men or, or women. They, they, it applies equally. Um, I would say, though, that, of course, there are some professions where men are more heavily represented. I mean, one of the people I mentioned in the book is a, is a fighter pilot, Phil Bayman, and although there are fighter pilots, there are female fighter pilots, they're much less uh, common than male ones. Um, and so I think if you look in particular areas of practice, when you're looking at people who have been in their line of work for many, many decades, that often reflects um, a different way of, in which people came into their profession 30 or 40 years ago from what we would find now. Good. Thank you. Um, last question. Um, this uh, lady uh, wants to ask, um, do you think the journey to mastery changes as you get older? Is it as easy, in inverted commas, for someone in mid or later life to become expert in a new skill as it is for someone younger if they have the time and the patience? Another very interesting question. I think there are pros and cons to getting older. <laughs> um, I think, um, of course, if you're... If you're very early in your in your uh, in your career, you're much younger. Then the process that I've described of of spending a lot of time doing time is is something that you 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 probably engage with in a different way from when you're older. Because by the time you're older, you have you have had a, a number of other experiences that you can kind of feed back into the new thing that you're that you're taking up. I mean, um, whenever I've taken on something new later on in my career, I have been able to feed into that experience from earlier on that, that kind of, that I can make sense of. So I think in some ways the process takes longer as you're older, particularly with the, the fine psychomotor skills and things, that can be more of a challenge to absorb and become good at quickly than it was earlier on. But on the other hand, you have a much greater understanding uh, of what you're trying to 
uh, aim for very often and you have more experience particularly of things having gone wrong and you having had to put them right in other areas of your of your life so I think it swings and roundabouts I think it can be equally effective uh, at whatever stage you, you're at and whatever stage you're at it's a very good time to start off on another of these journeys and I think we are all of us um, on multiple simultaneous journeys towards mastery although we're usually at very different stages in each of them. The lady who asked that question um, was very much hoping that you were going to say yes and I think in a roundabout way that's what you said. So she'd be very uh, in a nutshell, yes. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. Well, thank, thank you again so much. Would you just like to tell our um, audience um, about your next lecture and when it is? Yes, indeed. So my next Gresham lecture is a week today. It's on Wednesday, the 7th of October at 6pm. And it will be, uh, I will be sharing the platform with Joshua Byrne, the bespoke tailor um, I, I introduced you to briefly in my talk. Uh, the, the title of the talk is what... Uh, medicine can learn from Savile Row and we'll be exploring not only these parallels between surgery and tailoring in terms of stitching and joining things together but much deeper and I think more interesting parallels around the whole idea of bespoke so I do hope you'll be able to join us then. Thank you.